the second season of you is packed with Easter eggs, including secret Beck and Benji references, Forty discovering the truth about Peach Salinger's murder, plus the iconic carpet from The Shining. Yippee ki yay, movie lovers, I'm Jan, and in this video I'm revealing 18 killer details you might have missed in season 2 of you. There will of course be spoilers, so take care if you haven't caught up. LA life and its obsession with health and wellness in particular are satirised in season 2, especially by Joe, who, coming from New York, finds Angelinos particularly irritating. Interestingly though, Moon Juice, which Forty declared essential to safely tripping on LSD, was actually referenced in an amusing moment in season 1, when Joe's colleague Ethan raves about the Moon Juice cookbook. Amanda Chantal Bacon has a dope recipe in Moon Juice cookbook, Cook Cosmically for Body, Beauty and Consciousness. Kill me. Sounds great, Ethan. Another season 1 callback pops up after Joe and Love break up, and Ellie sends him a top 10 list of dating apps. At number 2 is Love Hooks, an app co-created by one of Joe's previous victims. Benjamin J. Ashby, two failed careers, model, oh boy, and co-creator of a dating app that connects people through musical tastes called Love Hooks. One of the best hidden links back to Joe's past life in New York is the name of the store where he meets Love for the first time, Anavrin. Obviously Anavrin is... Wait for it. Nirvana, spelled backwards. Nirvana is actually the name of the store right next to Mooney's bookstore back in New York. Beck also wore a Nirvana t-shirt in season 1, and in one of the second season flashbacks, Joe's mother is also wearing that same t-shirt design. So it seems all this is likely a hint that Joe is especially drawn to things he connects, maybe unconsciously, to his mother. The original meaning of the word Nirvana is a state of bliss and tranquility, and the fact that Anavran is the opposite of this word might be the first indication that the Quins who own the grocery store are not quite as lovely as they might first seem. The drug fueled 8th episode of season 2 was particularly crazy, and there were also numerous fascinating Easter eggs which the showrunners and production designers snuck into the episode. A version of The Shining Hotel's carpet with its characteristic pattern appears in the corridors of the hotel where Forty takes Joe and Ellie to work on his screenplay, which seems especially fitting as Jack Nicholson's character also uses The Shining's hotel as a place to write. The scene where you can spot the carpet plays out in a similar way to the iconic vision of the twins that Danny has in The Shining. In You, Joe is out of his mind on the LSD that Forty spiked him with, and as he turns the corner of the hotel's corridor, he sees a vision of Candace which actually turns out to be Dimitri. As you can see, the colour of the carpet is different compared to the one in The Shining, but it's the same distinctive pattern. The second Shining reference comes from the hotel room that Forty locks Joe into. The room number 217 is the same number as the haunted room in Stephen King's original novel. In that haunted room in The Shining, Jack Torrance sees a vision of a creepy woman in a bathtub, and during his LSD trip, Joe also sees a ghostly vision of his mother appear to him while he's freaking out in the bathtub. And similar to how the ghosts in the Overlook Hotel incite Jack's violent rage, so too does a vision of Joe's mother spur him on to almost murder Forty. It was Forty's sudden realisation that Beck was killed by her ex-boyfriend, not Dr Nicky, that led Joe to almost kill Love's brother. But even before this ultimate revelation, Forty was also figuring out other secret details about Beck, which we can spot by looking closely at this whiteboard. Here we can see that Forty has also figured out that Peach didn't commit suicide, as the official version of events stated, but that she was, instead, murdered. Joe is well aware in Season 2 that Peach's murder could come back to bite him one day, given that the Salinger family had a PI investigating her death at the end of Season 1, and that he accidentally left evidence behind that he was at Peach's family home in Greenwich. What if they take fingerprints? What if they take DNA? Not like there's a crusty jar of piss in Peach Salinger's house or anything. Joe's paranoia about the Salingers tracking him down may well have revealed itself when he went back to a Nava room for snacks and moon juice during his crazy LSD-filled adventures. The next day, when Joe asks Calvin to tell him what happened when he found him in the store in the middle of the night, Calvin says, Okay, you gotta remember the part where you were ranting about how the peaches were mad at you. <laughs> and it's no coincidence that during his first encounter with love, she jokes to him, Excuse me? Do you think this peach looks like a butt? There's a funny bit of meta-commentary about Yu's first season, when Ellie passes critical judgement over Forty's script for his adaptation of Beck's book The Dark Face of Love. First off, 
The script is predictable. Okay, well, I was staying true to the source material. And the female perspective is sorely lacking. Oh. Beck was real. She humps the pillow multiple times. It's a humorous recognition by the show's own writers that, like the original book, almost everything in you is told from Joe's point of view, with one small exception in the fourth episode of season one, where some of the episode was told from Beck's perspective. What was that? Eight seconds? There's also a joke about the somewhat ridiculous alias Candace uses to hide her identity when she arrives in LA. You also said your name was Amy Adam, which come to think of it sounds really stupid. What was Britney Spear already taken? The name Amy Adam is also an Easter egg to the book Hidden Bodies, which season two is based on. In the novel, Amy is a completely separate character from Candace. Basically, she's an ex-girlfriend of Joe's who runs away from New York after she scams him. Joe then leaves New York to hunt Amy down with the intention of killing her. The TV show neatly reverses this by having Amy, aka Candace, track Joe down instead. The show also gets to play around with our expectations of what will happen by the end of season two by getting Forty to deliver a little red herring early on in the season when he sits down with Joe to discuss his script, Bang, Marry, Kill. In the end, our guy has to murder all three women. It's like the ultimate irony. Now, when you watch this for the first time, you might think it means that Joe will end up killing the three main women in his life right now, Candace, Delilah, and Love. Especially when you think back to how he basically did the same to three women in season one, Beck, Peach, and Candace, who Joe assumed he'd killed. However, it's a bit of a red herring, as the surprise villain of the second season is Love, who ends up killing Candace and Delilah. And if we add that she also killed her family's au pair Sophia, that makes Love the one to kill three women by the end. Season 2's writers also have some fun with the famous dramatic principle of Chekhov's gun, which for anyone who's unfamiliar is the basic idea that every element in a story should serve a purpose, and that, for example, if you draw attention to a gun, then that gun must go off at some point in the story. In You it's used as a big clue to who the secret killer of season 2 will actually be when Forty begins to drunkenly explain his feature film idea at Henderson's party. It's Chekhov's knife, and as soon as we see it, we know throats are gonna get cut. But we don't know who's, and we don't know why. It's just cutting an apple right now, but the audience is going to be subconsciously terrified. This is a major hint that when we see Love expertly use a knife to butcher a piece of meat, that she'll end up butchering several people by the end of the season. And hold your knife like this. Up here. Mm -hmm. By the way, we owe the principle of Chekhov's gun to influential Russian playwright and short story writer Anton Chekhov, who hated any element in a story making false promises to the audience. And the writers of You joke around with this idea when Forty tells Joe about how his script's developing. I don't think false promises is gonna happen. It's a short story not a feature film. Chekhov's gun also pops up when Joe breaks into Henderson's basement looking for evidence of his crimes against underage girls. There he discovers a robot vacuum cleaner that starts up automatically. In a case of Chekhov's Roomba, the device comes into play on Joe's next visit after he kills Henderson, when it switches on automatically and mixes Henderson's blood with Joe's blood from his nosebleed. The psychological thriller Gone Girl gets some interesting references in this season of You. First of all, there's a very deliberate decision to name Delilah's police officer hookup David Fincher. That's the same name as the director of Gone Girl, a little detail that doesn't escape Joe's observation. Like Officer Other David Fincher. And the ending of the second season also has numerous parallels with the ending of Gone Girl. Spoilers for that movie ahead, but you can skip to this timestamp in case you haven't seen it. In the final episode, Love tells Joe she's pregnant, which is the only thing that stops him from killing her and leaving. Similar to how Rosamund Pike reveals she's pregnant to Ben Affleck with his child at the end of Gone Girl, which again is the only reason he decides to stay with her. And the twist in both Gone Girl and You Season 2 is that the main female protagonist is revealed to be a psychopath or sociopath who secretly engineered numerous key events in the story. Officer Fincher is also used for a humorous reference to a famous TV detective when Joe snarkily comments that Fincher operates with all the nuance of Columbo. And true to Joe's observation, in the final episode before Fincher lets Ellie leave police custody, he uses Columbo's trademark catchphrase. Oh, and one more thing. Oh, one more thing, sir. Oh, one more thing. Just one more thing, sir. 
Yes, Lieutenant. The final scene of season two is clearly setting up the third season, but there's a very subtle musical and audio Easter egg in this scene that signals Joe's about to have his attention drawn to yet another woman. You need to listen very carefully because as Joe walks out into the garden and thinks about his fate, there's a little bell sound in the music that reminds me of the doorbell at Mooney's that rang when Beck first entered his life in the pilot episode. But that's not how destiny works, is it? Well, hello there. That doorbell also rang when Candace came back into Joe's life at the end of season one. And a little bell is now ringing for Joe at the end of season two, as a brand new woman seems set to become the object of his obsession. One of the earliest clues the writers laid for us about the ending of season two was right in the opening scene of the first episode, when we see the body of a red-headed actress on a film set lying in a pool of blood, complete with Candace's signature leather jacket and heart-shaped sunglasses. And I go into that and all the other secret clues about love's dark nature in my ending and twist explained video. Tap the screen here, or there's a link you can follow in the video description. So did you spot any other cool details or easter eggs in season 2? And what were your favourite moments or new characters? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoyed this, then a like and a share are hugely appreciated. Tap left for my next new video, or tap right for another video you're sure to like. Thanks for watching and see you next time, yippee ki movie lovers!